dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now. again everybody and welcome back to ring respect radio right here on the video bros network i am bobby munson i'm joined as always by the man with the angelic voice you know him as papa smokes how you doing tonight sir hey how you doing munson and how are you people doing out there hopefully everyone's doing wonderful staying safe staying healthy as always we're always looking out for your absolute best but while you're doing that why don't you look out for our absolute best and go ahead and click the subscribe button down below Turn on the notification bell so you know anytime we release brand new material right here on the Video Bros Network. Also, while you're at it, go on over and check out our good friends at Backbreaker Media who have past episodes of Ring Respect Radio, both on their YouTube channel as well as over on Podbean and many other platforms. I mean, Ring Respect, uh, we're, we're getting out there, Papa Smokes. So you, you can find us when you actually Google us nowadays. Yeah, we're coming along in the technology. Hey, Munson, we're not so hard. Uh, that's right, yeah. It's uh, it's getting a little better. We're figuring this thing out bit by bit. But uh, here we are with another edition of the show, and this is going to be a fun one. We're going to be doing one big review here tonight, and it's Kings of Coliseum from our good friends over at Major League Wrestling. Yes, we know we're behind the eight ball with our reviews, but that's okay because Papa Smokes and I were always a little bit late to the party. But it's fun to do anyway. Papa Smokes, Kings of Coliseum, did you enjoy the show? Yeah, very much so, Munson. I've been looking forward to a pay-per-view from MLW for this entire past year. We're almost right around to March again, so it has almost been a year since all this stuff shut down due to COVID. And, uh, yeah, we finally got back to some live shows from some of the promotions we like. We got MLW Fusion back on the air. And then first pay-per-view, albeit a small one, but Kings of Coliseum uh, just couldn't be more excited for the matches. Yeah, it was a good old time. I was uh, at home here. I think I was having a week off from work, so I was uh, cracking into the cases of beer, hitting up the MLW. I had a good old time that night watching Kings of Coliseum. What a fun time it was. And man, Papa Smokes, how close were you and I when it came to our predictions on that one? I mean, aside from the one match that we'll talk about not even taking place, we nailed every other single uh, choice that we had on the card. Yeah, yeah, I think that's... uh... That's testament to our extreme experience in watching wrestling, but also the the builds were good, I think. Uh, I I was still uncertain in my mind about a few of those matches, but I I had a feeling as to how this first one might turn out in some of the booked matches there, and yeah, we did all right in our picks, didn't we? We sure did. So uh, let's uh, let's start discussing the matches so we can go over it. Uh, When it came to that first match, the Von Ericks versus the Dirty Blondes for the championship, uh, we had both predicted that the Von Ericks were going to take this win, and we'll get to that in a moment. But here we go. This one turned into a, I think they changed it to a bunkhouse brawl kind of last minute or something, that this match was basically no no DQ, false count anywhere type style match, if I'm not mistaken there. Right, Papa Smokes? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I also realized that it was going to be that until match time. So they added the stipulation. Not exactly sure why, but... Of course, uh, that's going to lead to a much wilder tag team match, and isn't that how that one started? Uh, it's just an all-out brawl right off the bat. They uh, Both teams fought outside the ring for some time before this thing even started to look like a proper match into the into the ring. Yeah, it was kind of a little wild, a little all over the place, definitely. Um, I think the Vaughn Ericks are fantastic. Really enjoyed them as a tag team. I, I feel like 
Maybe this wasn't the perfect introduction to the Dirty Blondes, uh, especially in a tag match. We didn't get to really find out if they're going to stand the test of time as a team there. Uh, not taking anything away from them. I mean, they definitely got something there, I think, personally. I think we're going to get to see more as they kind of unfold. And, you know, the Von Erics, it was great for them. Great, uh, fantastic pickup for the win and be remaining the MLW Tag Team Champions. Yeah, yeah, a nice win for the Von Erics. They're looking good as tag champs, but uh, a lot of competition in MLW at all times. One of the little questions or stories that piqued my interest in this match is that uh, the Dirty Blondes are coming out as members of the stud stable, which of course would be Colonel Tom Parker, I presume. Uh, do you remember him from the old WCW days, uh, Bobby? And even before that, uh, he was a manager, uh, a cowboy style, almost like uh, Colonel Sanders or uh, what was the guy that was Elvis Presley's manager? Uh, he was kind of like that guy, uh, uh, a huckster, shyster, southern manager. And of course, this guy's played by uh, uh, one of the Fuller boys, uh, uh, Rob Fuller. And uh, yeah, he uh, ran a pretty big stable in WCW back in the days and in other feds in the South throughout the years. So uh, this is really the only mention we've had on had of it on the MLW so far. So. Uh, I'm expecting to maybe see uh, the stud stable expand as a full-on faction, and once we see uh, Colonel Tom Parker appear, maybe he'll uh, he'll enlighten us as to uh, what direction he's going with his faction. But this could also be interesting for uh, Major League Wrestling. Oh, definitely. So, and you know, I mean, it, it's nice that Major League Wrestling and Kurt Bauer have done so much work in paying homage and respect to classic professional wrestling and at the same time bringing it in with a modern twist i mean we can't say that they are a complete throwback to the past they do have a new taste a new flavor to them and everything like that but there is that respect level which is what makes them i think most enjoyable because we're getting the best of what is good in today's world of professional wrestling mixed with what made it good in the first place to begin with yeah that's a good way to put it. Uh, the guys of uh taking inspiration from the past and tried to make it new again uh, with some success uh, also. Uh, you know, we watched uh, in NWA the uh, the brother tag team. What were those guys' names? Uh, the, they were looking pretty good also, but uh, uh, the same thing, just taking an old-school philosophy from the 70s, 80s uh, tag team wrestling scene and updating it a little bit to today to be palatable for today's audience and dirty blondes looking like they're doing that pretty successfully but uh, we'll see what kind of a run they get in mlw yeah hopefully some uh, great things coming up for them obviously great things on board for both the von eric boys so a uh, great uh, win for them and a uh, huge shout out so yeah we were both on the mark there both picked the von eric so we get a check mark beside our name there and moving on here's the match where it's kind of hard to give us a check mark or an X against it because it never even took off. We were supposed to get Simon Gotch versus Jordan Oliver in this grudge, grudge match, and suddenly Simon Gotch was MIA. We had no Gotch. What's going on there, Papa Smokes? Yeah, that, but I was wondering, uh, since they were uh, kind of speaking about it during the show, saying like uh, Simon Gotch uh, not in the building or, or not currently available for the show, and we're talking that uh, Jordan Oliver was storming around the back looking for his opponent. I was kind of thinking this was a work that it was, uh, you know, some sort of subterfuge by a contra unit that was going to, uh, you know, they would come out and sneak attack Jordan Oliver at some point during the match. But then, uh, no, I guess that was for real, and, and the match didn't happen on the pay-per-view. Do you have any inside information on what happened in the background of this, Bob? I'm not too sure what happened in the background. Again, I, I just was trying to listen best I could to the commentary to find out as the story unfold. But I guess, in a sense, you know, I you had to feel like this was going to be a setup all along that at some point, uh, not only Simon Gotch, but the rest of Contra were going to get involved in the evening in some capacity, which we will find out soon enough would be the case. But uh, yeah, we were... Uh, Shorted the match, they would say, uh, later would tell us, uh, going to be postponed. We would get it at a later date. But uh, that yeah. meant, uh, yeah, so we were going to be out that one match, and we'd have uh, some other stuff come up before we'd hit uh, our next match up anyway, including 
we got to see a little bit of filthy Tom Lawler talking about his 2020 Opera Cup victory. Yeah, yeah, always a pleasure to listen to Filthy Tom. He cuts a nice promo, and uh, not only did he, uh, you know, crow about his uh, op, uh, he made the official announcement of coming to Filthy Island. Suppose this is, and I'm gonna guess it's uh, it's a little statement of the grammar you can show that he had how but uh you know to make phil it could be anything yeah i'm not too sure just yet i know obviously this is kind of a his way of kind of making a joke i believe about uh, dana white with the ufc and having fight island during yeah. uh covid here and everything so it's a nice little thing that uh filthy tom was doing uh, considering his uh mma background and everything like that so i i'm curious to see where he goes with it filthy island hey i mean i'm on board I'm ready to take a vacay, go over on Filthy Island, see what's uh, see what's in store. Yeah, yeah, we might not make it back in one piece, though. So. Yeah. But uh, before we got to the uh, middleweight championship match, we were hit again with the PWI Top 10. Uh, very similar to the previous PWI Top 10, but just for those listening who didn't check in out our, our last show and maybe haven't seen MLW, we're just going to go over this again real quick. In at number 10 on the PWI Top 10 was Mods Kruger, the Black Hand of Contra. We had at yeah. n- number 9, we had Heavyweight Hustle, Kelvin Tankman. Number 8, we had Triple A's Laredo Kid. Number 7 was ACH. Number 6, we had Richard Holiday. Number 5, we had Myron Reed. Number 4, we had L.A. Park. At number 3, Low Key. Number two, Filthy Tom Lawler. Number one, it's your boy Hammer, Alexander Hammerstone. And then, of course, at the top of the mountain, the champion, Jacob Fatu. I mean, you can't argue too much with that list from the PWI when it comes to the current state of things over in Major League Wrestling. And that's pretty much uh, how my ranking go to Kruger. Uh, the new guy at number 10 doesn't have a whole ton of big grief behind him yet, and then the uh, various uh, competitors ranked according to their, you know, roughly sort of status or their uh, their uh, status with uh, popularity with the fans and such like that, and then going down to the where the champions are, Mike Reed and Alexander Hammers, Jacob Fatu at the very top of the list. Uh, awesome, and uh, just al- always uh, always used to read the ra- ratings and. Pro Wrestling Illustrated for the different federations, you could kind of kind of get a sense of uh, you know who was getting hot and who was cooling off a little bit in the rankings. So I, I always like seeing uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated affiliated with uh, MLW. Yeah, definitely. This has been quite interesting to see, and I, I like what you say there. The whole falling off and everything it makes sense. Uh, their way of ranking makes sense too. I mean. It's logical. Everybody is kind of shuffling around that list where they deserve to be shuffled around as it kind of goes along. And, you know, sticking at the top of the list are the guys that deserve to be there. I mean, obviously the champion Jacob fought too, but Alexander Hammerstone, your boy Hammer, the longest reigning MLW champion of any champion that the company has ever had. Yeah, yeah. And like we uh, discussed uh, on one of these previous reviews, Alexander Hammerstone was one of the wrestlers that wasn't active during the whole COVID shutdown, that, that whole uh, many months from March to November or whatever, but uh, he seemed to gain momentum. He just has good presence online and his social media. He shows lots of training. He's a funny guy. He interacts with the fans and stuff. I, I think his, his stock went up instead of going down like a lot of wrestlers did, so... The buzz for Hammerstone, uh, I think, is stronger now than it was when they were actively wrestling before COVID shutdown. So all eyes on Hammerstone. Everybody wants that title match of Hammerstone versus Fatu, and uh, that's going to shake the whole earth when that finally happens. Oh, yeah. and I mean, the build has just been fantastic towards that. Yeah, the, the tease is there, but, I mean, hey, there's – there's going to be things coming up. I mean, it's are we going to get that title match after all? Because, I mean, coming up on a upcoming episode of MLW, Jacob Fatu is going to be defending that title against someone not Alexander Hammer. So we could see an upset 
And maybe that uh, title match will be even further prolonged before we see those two lock up. Yeah, we can't know for sure, but uh, I know that the, the fans are clamoring for this match. Uh, uh, Court Bauer is getting tweets and letters every day uh, that I see him respond to him about that match. But, you know, what, what are you going to say in his position? He's be patient and watch him, and that's what we're going to do. Yes, sir, sir. But speaking of championship matches, why don't we start talking about one right now? This is the next match on the card from Kings of Coliseum. This was middleweight champion Myron Reed taking on the debuting Leo Rush. And we both had picked, uh, we thought the new champ would walk out of this one, Leo Rush. But let's uh, let's break down the match and let everyone know what we thought and get to the winner after that. Yeah, yeah, okay, awesome. This is a... Uh... This is a big match for MLW. Uh, it's got to be a bit of a coup to get uh, Leo Rush from out of WWE. His, his name is quite a lot bigger than it used to be. Uh, he, there were other places he probably could have gone, but he picked MLW. That's a good thing for them. And at this uh, middleweight, uh, they, they want good technicians. They want good stars. They got Byron Reed out of Injustice. Wearing the chest protector and all that, he uh, he picked up that belt late last year, and then uh, now we got Leo Rush in here, uh, just totally playing the heel, acting like a big star, acting like he's bigger and better than anybody else in the in, in that division in MLW, and uh, he had, he was immediately uh, shoehorned into this uh, title match with Myron Reed. So uh, yeah, you could see that Reed was. Con- about it, but he's also a competitor. He spoke before this match about that he wants the competition. He wants the best uh, wrestlers in the world at the middleweight uh, division for for his own uh, skill level to increase. And then uh, he's got a huge challenge in Leo Rush. And what did you think of the first minutes of this match, Munson? It was all good chain grappling and amateur wrestling. They were, they were going at it a little bit for real there. Yeah, you know what, Papa Smokes? I was pleasantly surprised not only by the beginning of this match but I think just overall in general I you know we had spoke last time previously when we were talking about Leo Rush saying you know not anything that really stood out that made us a fan of Leo Rush I mean he's young we know he's quick I, I've seen the work he was doing in WWE I mean in ring I wasn't really high on any of it but I mean the the kid can talk like I mean he he's got the gift of gab definitely and you always could tell he has that ability to make you want to want to dislike him, right? He's got that that I don't know what to call it, but that you know certain bit of charisma, but it's like an anti charisma that makes you just really hate on him, the kind of thing. And you know you love to watch a guy get in a fight with this guy, and you know what, man, we got a fight this night, and man, it it changed my mind a little on Leo Rush. I would say that I enjoyed a Leo Rush match for the first time ever. For a smart asshole, looking at, he's an arrogant little jerk, and uh, he likes to run his mouth a lot, and he he does it great. You know, he he has a very slappable face, and uh, and uh, that that's what you want when you're when you're playing that. Uh, part in a wrestling show and uh, I mean, you got a big title match coming up so uh, yeah like you I thought this was good in the ring and, uh, admittedly uh, the the observator with fast flippy stuff isn't my favorite kind of wrestling but it which was a little bit different than that uh, it had some of those elements but it had a whole bunch more um, great stuff and we said a bunch of uh, amateur looking uh style wrestling these guys obviously both have a background in it uh we saw a couple of tests of strength we saw some very inventive offense both had some moves and variations of moves i've never seen before uh a lot of uh rush's offense i thought was interesting that they were uh, kind of like traditional or conventional wrestling moves but he did them lower like kind of uh shifted them over to a smaller guy's style, such as he does those low drop kicks and he does uh, little short DETs like, like, like from his knees or from uh, when the guy's on the second 
like just leaning over the second rope and stuff, little short, quick moves like that that seem like they're suited better for guys of a smaller stature. I find it inventive and interesting. And uh, yeah, in, in overall in this match, I, I thought it was quite tremendous. And I thought it was the best match on the card uh, by a good shot. So uh, uh, Rush getting the pin with his final hour frog splash. And uh, wow, new champ, Leo Rush, middleweight champion of MLW. And uh, yeah, not too much of a surprise. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, oh. Sorry, you cut out there for a second, man. You still there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, um, so, yeah, no, I mean, this match easily was hands down the best on the card there for sure, Pop Smokes. I loved it. I, again, like I got to say, like you, where you're talking about the uh, moves that Leo Rush is doing, traditional moves and kind of taking them to a, a smaller stature guy's ability to do them, or not ability to do them, but bringing them down to something that suits more his physical size was so effective. And I, I'm glad you brought that up. And at the same time, everything Myron Reed did in this match was great too. Myron Reed really held his own in there as well. And in many ways, I think really brought even more prestige and, you know, attention to the middleweight division of MLW and that MLW championship. We know that Leo Rush brings a name to the table for sure. Uh, now he's also crossing over to the music side. So there might be even some people outside of the wrestling community that might start to, you know, draw in from the success of Leo Rush with his music career and start to have eyes on the MLW product. And in particular, when you can see matches like this against guys like Myron Reed, who are great up and comers in this industry. Yeah, yeah, the very good point, too. I wanted to ask you about your your opinions about Myron Reed in this match too. I know in, in previous reviews, you haven't been completely uh, sold on this guy. And I, I'm not sure I was either. I, we had only really seen him over the past year or two, mostly in tag team matches with injustice, either with uh, Jordan Oliver or Cotto Brazil. But uh, this now, this is Myron Reed kind of like launching off into singles a little bit here too, because uh, injustice still only has, two members left, so uh, they're doing some more singles matches, and when Myron Reed picked up the middle beat championship, I, I must admit, I, I thought, okay, I, I didn't really see that one coming, because I'm not sure if I totally saw a star written all over Myron Reed, but since the singles matches he's had, he, he's really sold me on, on his uh, style and ability. I'm looking forward to seeing what's next for Myron in the MLW. Yeah, I think the I think the biggest thing was when we came back to watching MLW after all this time, uh, the first thing we get Myron Reed involved in too is the match with Brian Pillman Jr., which, you know, on paper seemed like it should have been a lot more interesting than it was. And it just, you know, it kind of fell flat and in some ways, in my opinion, didn't help Myron Reed. But then you put him in here, you you hyped this match and they brought it to the table. He gets in there with Leo Rush, who obviously, you know, would have learned quite a bit over in WWE and stuff like that, would have brought some of that to the table along with him, as long as, you know, as well as the training that he would have had along the way prior to heading over to the WWE. He brings us all to the table and can bring that kind of a match with a guy like Myron Reed. And Myron Reed not only held his own, but man, when he's getting into his promos now, Pop Smokes, I'm starting to become a bigger believer in what he's saying. When he's talking, he's... He, he's bringing it to the table and he's making me believe what he's saying, What that, you know, he's going to go out and do what he does kind of thing. And it, it's fantastic to watch this kid start to grow. And I think we're going to see great things from him. Yeah, yeah. Good point about the promos too is that, yeah, he, he makes you feel like he's a real dude that's saying real shit, you know? So, so um, he sounds, he has conviction and uh, he sounds determined and, I think this guy's going to be good. I, I didn't, I got to admit, I didn't really see it at first, but I, I see it now and I'm excited. What do you think MLW will do with him at this point? Do you think they'll get him in a program continued with uh, Leo Rush or a, a new opponent for him? I, uh, you know, I kind of think with uh, what we saw coming up next that there is something else in store for Myron Reed currently. I think it would almost be better not to put him in a program with Leo Rush. Let Leo take that title and bring on some challengers along the path 
before you come back to a match against Myron Reed when you get part two. I think build Myron a little bit more and make the next match between Myron Reed and Leo Rush that much more of a big big deal. Nice. Okay. Well, we'll keep our eyes open on that, and uh, we'll see what's next for Myron. Well, definitely. I think I think we can talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, before we get to that uh, Myron Reed segment, though, uh, Selena was then mentioned she was going to be running Fusion this coming up week. Uh, she is going to be in charge of MLW Fusion, the producer, the one making the matches, and man, she dropped a big match on us here, Papa Smokes. The tag titles on the line. The champs, the Von Eriks, taking on Los Parks in a uh, no DQ matchup with Filthy Tom Lawler as the guest referee. Man, this one stinks of high hell, if you ask me. Yeah, it sure does. It has uh, Selena's fingerprints all over it, doesn't it? Because uh, as uh, you know, sort of part-time manager, at least of uh, La Parca and Lost Parks. Uh, She's wanted to get them in title matches and main events all this time that we've been watching MLW the past few years. She's got her own produ uh, production company, and uh, yeah, she's she's all about the Mexican wrestlers, and L.A. Park is her man. So uh, uh, when they gave her control of this episode of Fusion, as she's directed and uh, produced a couple of episodes in the past, you know that she's going to uh, set up her boys in this. And look at this. Yeah, like you said, it stinks of, to high heaven. Not only do Lost Parks have a tag team title match against the Von Erics, but yes, special referee Tom Lawler. We all know of his history with the Von Erics, which has even been recent. He was uh, he was an ally and their friend for a long time burned on them viciously and a, a feud erupted of that, which is what barely finished by the time, uh, again, by the time COVID started. So uh, I'm sure there's still a uh, molten simmering there, and uh, I, I'm highly skeptical that it'll be torn all up straight down the middle. Uh, well, I guess we'll find out at the next ed edition of MLW Fusion. But, uh, yeah, that's a big one, and it's going to be tough for the champs. But... Up next, before we got to the main event of the evening, Papa Smokes, we're going back to Myron Reed. Myron, Myron Reed, Jordan Oliver, cutting a promo on the back. Myron basically congratulating Leo Rush, saying he was the better man on that night, but he was going to come back better than ever, and that he would uh, end up taking back his middleweight championship. That's what I meant by that great promo Myron Reed's starting to get a lot better at. And all of a sudden, man, the two get jumped, absolutely jumped from behind by Contra Unit, and a new member of Contra Unit, man, it's it's Davari. Yeah, isn't that great? Hey, I, I recognize him immediately. Uh, Sean Davari, now one of uh, the Contra soldiers that uh, Joseph Samael has been hinting at, that he's been saying. He's got soldiers all over the world. He's got people uh, uh, investigating all kinds of things, and he's got his uh, fingers, you know, in the puppets uh, all over the world and such. Yeah, he's got his new soldier, Sean Devari. So that, very interesting. Uh, what do you think of Sean Devari? He's been a pretty good uh, uh, indie star for a long time, including a, a good run in WWE as well. Yeah, I like, you know, I like the Devaris. I mean, any time I've seen any of them work, I think they are fantastic. They know how to work a crowd. They know how to work a mic. Uh, they got a good look to them, too, and man... He's going to bring a lot, not only to Contra Unit, but to MLW in general. Again, it's a name that enough people in the community know about to start having them turn to MLW and go, hey, wait a second, there's some good shit going down over at this company. Yeah, yeah. I think if you can get your hands on a good talent like uh, Sean Davari, that, that's easily a feather in uh, Court Bauer's cap. Uh, he's experienced, he's wrestled on TV a whole bunch of times before he's He's uh, been in federations of various uh, talent levels, uh, you know, from, from high to low. And uh, and then, like you say, he, he kind of fits the part of, uh, you know, the Contra is an international uh, uh, cattle kind of. They're, they're like, uh, they have their uh, soldiers all around the world. And Davari, well, he's, he's American as apple pie, but he has that uh, ethnic look to him, that Middle Eastern look and then that name. So they can, he fits right into the international uh, flavor of Contra and uh, something else about Davari, man. That look at the body on that guy. Hey, like how's oh, yeah. his bodybuilding going? Like 
The guy's got muscles on top of muscles, plus he's ripped to shreds. Good God, the bodybuilding uh, that guy's been doing is just outstanding. You know, I've, I've watched a few things about some of the training regimens that some wrestlers go through and everything like that to get the bodies they do. And damn it, does that take a lot of commitment and just... Oh. It, it is insane what they go through, Papa Smokes. And I, I my hat's off to them all, but respect for anyone who does that and is able to get themselves in that kind of shape. Yeah, yeah. And the, that, yeah, that's just, I mean, Davari just looks like one of the best of them all. Like, it, it's, wow, it really got to uh, tip, my hat, tip my hat to him for the, the sacrifice he's gone through. But then again, this is how you get over in the wrestling business. Uh, you know, there's various ways through in-ring work and promos, but part of it is the look. And you got to look like a wrestler if you want the fans to believe you are a wrestler. And uh, I realize that's not always the case these days, but uh, I always say it, it never hurts. You're, 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 you're going in there uh, as an athlete uh, in a struggle against another athlete kind of thing. So you got to show that you train. And, and the, I like the body, guys. I appreciate that. It makes it a lot easier to get over it, I think, too. Uh, people like looking at a healthy person with a great body and uh yeah Devari he looks tough he looks strong he, he's not the biggest guy either but look what he's done with his body it makes it a lot more convincing oh yeah exactly i mean there's there's perfect examples throughout the entire industry of this and over many many years and so many people will question you get a guy who you know puts in all the work to get themselves built up and shredded and immediately then you get the judgmental people who start to oh you know it's the roids or it's this it's this I don't care yeah. what it is. Those guys go through hell in order to get their bodies to look like that so they can look like a goddamn wrestler on television for you. Suck it up and enjoy the fact that these guys are making that sacrifice. Oh, absolutely. And if you're going to be a warrior on TV, then you got to look like one. And, uh, yeah, guys like uh, Davari and Hammerstone and, and all the rest of them are, are warriors in the, in the weight room. And... And that's the sacrifice it takes. Not not everybody can be a wrestler. Uh, although that again, that's changing nowadays too. But I don't even want to keep the Davari, a uh, great talent, a uh, really good young guy that that does have a bunch of experience though too. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see his work contract. Yeah, it's uh, going to be fantastic to see him in there and see where this unfolds. I mean, the attack has been made on injustice, so I believe. Now we can argue that we're going to see a, a, a different side of things. It's going to be injustice going up against members of Team Contra. I can imagine Simon Gotch and Davari might be making a tag team. We'll be seeing up against Myron Reed and Jordan Oliver coming up sometime soon. Yeah, yeah. and I think that match of uh, Simon Gotch versus Jordan Oliver has been rescheduled to uh, – this coming week, or yeah, this exact week, I think. So we are going to see that match, uh, you know, as it's been postponed. But I like that scenario. I could easily see that and uh, contra unit versus injustice. But uh, once again, we'll have to see a different side of injustice as well because they're straight up villains and they cheat all the time and they uh, they you know, fix each other up for their finishes at the end of matches and stuff and uh, pin people with their feet on the ropes and all the other nefarious tricks. So will they be doing this while Contra is doing the same thing? We'll have to see, or maybe Injustice has got a new way of looking at things, but uh, we'll find out in future episodes. And I'm sure we'll review that on this podcast. So keep listening, everybody. Yeah, well, I mean, you could almost make the argument that in some sense, maybe Myron Reed did kind of take a little bit of a baby face turn in the sense that his match with Leo Rush, I mean, Leo Rush is clearly playing more of the heel in a matchup like that. J yeah. Jordan Oliver clearly could have, you know, interfered or done something to help out Myron Reed to assure a successful title change like a heel would have, and that never happened too. So it almost seems like, without so much coming forth with it outright, that Injustice is taking a little bit of a turn. And then with the beat down from Contra, I think might be the start of their full face baby turn. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I, I think that might go well, too, because uh, I think that that'll uh, appeal to some fans. Uh, in fact, I'm already behind them, uh, whatever they do, especially when they're taking on the massive and powerful Contra. So, uh, 
Yeah, well, I look forward to Injustice versus Contra. Now, now Contra's got a few uh, feuds on their hands, too. I hope they're not stretching themselves too thin. Yeah, well, they've been pissing off a few people. And speaking of which, that brings us to the main event of Kings of Coliseum. It's the Black Hand of Contra, Mods Kruger, taking on the National Openweight Champion. It's your boy, Alexander Hammerstone. And, man, again, we're coming down to the prediction side of things, Papa Smokes. You, you and I both were in that kind of frame of mind saying this one was going to end not clean. This was going to end in a no contest. There was almost no way out of it, but you couldn't put the belt on Mods Kruger yet. You couldn't take the belt away from Hammerstone yet. You also couldn't have Hammerstone lose at this point. And this ended up being exactly what we thought it was going to be, but to no detriment of the show or the company. Yeah, yeah, the, it was fairly clear how this was going to go, especially the way that the build was made, too, that it was just out-and-out out aggression and hatred towards each other, and a, a flaming hot feud. Had a nice, uh, kind of tense feel before the match. Uh, I've been anticipating this, but I'm wondering what they would do about it. Wondering what Hammerstone was going to do when he got in there against the seemingly indestructible Kruger. And uh, my other big question in my mind was, if Hammerstone even makes it that far, will he be able to hit the Nightmare Pendant on Kruger uh, because of uh, Mads' uh, height? Did you ever think about that one, Munson? That, uh, yeah. That's a difficult move to do at the best of times, but uh, on an opponent that's over you know, 6'6 six, six or 6'7, six, don't even know if he could do that on that guy. Yeah, but then again, do you see some of the moves that Alexander Hammerstone pulled off in this match against oh. Mods Kruger? It was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Hey, he had no problem with the size differential whatsoever. I mean, Hammer's no small guy either. He's 6'3 or something and 250 pounds. He's a big, big boy. But, uh, you know, just the way they had done the build with uh, Kruger, we weren't sure if anything was going to affect him, if any moves were going to affect him. But, Hammerstone came in like a house on fire and he was hitting moves off the top rope and uh, brawling everywhere, hitting Mads with the belt. He obviously wasn't too concerned about what the referee thought about all this. And uh, yeah, yeah what a, they brawled for a while outside the, uh, outside the ring, disobeying the ref's orders to get back in. You knew that, you know, when they weren't even going to listen to the ref, that this wasn't going to end in any kind of a pinfall or anything like that but uh you also knew during the broadcast of this match that there was one of those little contra glitches that came over the air and you knew that they were watching and they were in the big balloons somewhere so uh, eventually this match got thrown out to no contest or double disqualification whatever you want to call it and uh, for excessive out of ring brawling and uh what did you think of the finish of this match? I thought it was fantastic use of it. I, I know so many people out there in the wrestling community, the modern day fans, get so upset when you don't have a, you know, a clean finish to a match. There's no clear, decisive win or anything like that. But, man, like the amount that we've gone back and done these reviews and the amount of matches I've gone back to watch to study some of these guys we're talking about and everything, and on your recommendations, Papa Smokes, this is a tactic that was wildly used very quite often in the territory days of wrestling. You know, having two guys, you know, brawl to a no contest or something like that in order to, you know, make sure that you're not taking the belt off somebody who you don't want to be taking the belt off yet while still protecting a guy like the size of Mads Kruger, who you don't want having chump out after only two squash match victories and then go up against Hammer and lose immediately. Yeah, yeah. See, they, they had to protect both wrestlers in this case because uh, you can't give Mads the build that he had and then they just have him uh, lose his first match of any consequence. So, in fact, uh, you know, you could also see what was going on here in the mind of Contra, too, was that obviously, uh, despite the fact that they have numerous members, you knew that when they sniffed out the threat that Hammerstone wanted Jacob Fatu wanted his title match, wanted wanted to get his hands on Fatu and take that uh, MLW heavyweight title. That was when Joseph Samael decided to get just basically hired muscle. He went out and found Mads Kruger, 
I think specifically just to go after Hammerstone and instead of uh, instead of using his other uh, pieces like Simon Gotch and, and all that, he, he got a new guy. It's basically a hitman who's only there really to protect the title around Fatou's waist. So when you do a match like this, I think, uh, especially when it's free on TV, I, I think what the promoter is thinking is that yeah, you will you will highlight the skills of each wrestler. You'll show that they match up to a certain extent, but then blow it off. Uh, have it a double DQ uh, and uh, and uh, breath stoppage and, and all that kind of stuff, and then keep building. Now they've given the fans a little bit of a taste of it. You've seen what they could or can do to each other. Now we'll set up, you know, uh, a little bit more plot line and a little bit more uh, story will build to the next time they face each other and maybe maybe this next time it'll be some kind of a gimmick match maybe they'll say you know like we don't want a referee in there the next time or maybe it'll be in the cage or who knows but uh, or maybe it'll be a series of matches we don't know any of this yet but i think that's the main roadblock in contra that alexander hammerstone has to battle through and yeah he was hired specifically for that purpose by joseph samuel yeah, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, that's exactly what's uh, going on, and I feel like, yeah, you're you're right. The gimmick match is exactly where I was thinking. Like, they they, they got to lead to eventually getting the title off Hammer in some way, I feel. And the logical yeah. way to do it with a guy the size of Mods Kruger and with him being a part of a faction like Contra is, like you say, a cage match, a no-DQ match, something where you know, it's not going to be a traditional loss for Hammerstone. So you keep him strong, keep him pissed off of the Contra unit so that instead of him going back and trying to re-challenge Kruger to get back to that championship, now he has a step towards, I want Jacob Fatu one-on-one, no Contra unit in the building. That's what the fans want, and eventually we're going to get it. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And um, I think they don't want to bury Kruger completely right off the bat either. So uh, I think sometimes you can work a, a gimmick match like that to where the uh, the heel, in this case Kruger, could take a pinfall loss but not look too bad in doing it because maybe you cut him off from his contract teammates and they weren't able to help him or, you know, it just wasn't an ideal situation for him somehow. And uh, that's the only reason he lost is that he kind of got screwed out of it. So you can still keep both guys looking good. And uh, yeah, that, that uh, open weight championship for Hammerstone might be more the more of a distraction these days than anything else. Cause no one seems to be able to get it off of him. Maybe what they'll do is change his perspective into uh, just gunning straight for Fatu, and they won't worry about that belt. We'll see what happens, but there's a few ways you could go about it. Yeah, you could also have him uh, give the championship up if he challenges Fatu, or have a you know again the 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 age old angle where you can have a guy relinquish the one championship in order to be able to fight for the other one, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you might have to. Uh hand it over to somebody else in Contra or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, he could, uh, with Selena kicking around and uh, the masterminds of Contra unit, you never know what uh, deal could be struck. Yeah, all sorts of things could happen. And I mean, hell, I'm looking forward to it. This only just made me love the MLW even more. I'm glad I watched this, Bob Smokes. What a great show, Kings of Coliseum. And I mean, it's free. You can go watch it right now, right on their YouTube channel. Anybody who hasn't seen Kings of Coliseum, first of all, sorry for the spoilers, but tough shit for you. Anyway, what you should do, whether you know who the winners are or not, is head on back to MLW's uh, site. Check them out there and check out previous episodes of MLW Fusion. Again, it never hurts to go back and watch a match, even if you do know what the results are going to be, especially when they're this good. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they're, all the episodes are up there, too. There's quite a bit of uh, history you can watch. They go back to the early 2000s, so, I mean, there's a whole bunch of good wrestling on on their YouTube channel, everything for free. And, uh, yeah, watch it and enjoy it. It's, it's some of the best stuff going on these days, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, me too, and uh, I'm glad we were able to start doing these MLW reviews. I mean, man, I, I almost think that this has been the thing we've been looking looking to do on this channel, Palpus Smokes, because guess what? 
this is actually starting to get a few bits of notice from some of the MLW fans and also the MLW roster themselves. Some of them actually interacting with the video bros a little bit and starting to take notice. Yeah. I mean, we've uh, we've woken MLW up to ring respect here. Yeah, I think so. I noticed you got a happy birthday wish from Alexander Hammerstone the other day. That's quite a nice little uh, treat for you. Yeah, that's right. We share the same birthday, me and uh, me and Alexander Hammerstone on January seventeenth. So, I uh, mean, he's probably just a just a kid in comparison to me right now. I'm not quite sure how old he is, but I definitely uh, believe he's got age in his favor when it comes to uh, me versus him. That's for sure. Oh yeah, yeah. We you don't want to go versus. Uh, stone for sure but uh in no way shape or form (laughs) no no we'll review his stuff though and uh, chat with him online if possible definitely so we're loving every bit of it and glad we were able to do this once again papa smokes uh anybody who's stuck around for the long haul if you haven't done so already go ahead and click that subscribe button down below and turn on the notifications bell as always we love you for listening thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time here on ring respect radio